Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, I'm Tony Mancini, the chair of the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee, also uh, representing uh, District 6 in Dartmouth. Welcome to the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee. It's March the 3rd, a few minutes after 1 o'clock. I guess the advantage of virtual meetings uh, on a snowy day like today, we don't have to travel to get to the meeting. So welcome, everyone. So I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. First of all, I'd like to uh, do the follow following land acknowledgement. The Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes we are all a treaty people. Uh, I'd like to do a roll call to see if our committee members are here and check their audio and their camera. Starting off with the uh, Vice Chair, uh, Councillor Catherine Morse. Catherine, are you there? We see her online, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to Catherine. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues and staff. Um, coming from a lovely snowy Fall River in District 1. I'm sure it's very picturesque down there. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Sam Austin from uh, lovely Darkwood. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's very pretty here too, with the snow sticking to the branches. As long as you don't have anywhere to, you need to go, of course. Well, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Sean Cleary. Hello, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Hello, Councillor and Deputy Mayor uh, Pam Lovelace. Good afternoon. I uh, just came in to. Uh, snowy Hammond's Plains from uh, City Hall. I uh, just want to make sure everybody, if you're on the road, please stay safe. It's uh, it's greasy out there. Uh, uh, good to have you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I'll go back to uh, uh, Vice Chair Council Moore. Is he with us? Yes, I am present now on my phone today. Okay, well, welcome, uh, Vice Chair. And we do have one of our colleagues as a visitor, uh, Councilor Paul Russell from Beautiful Sackville. Well, Councilor? Uh, good afternoon, and... Uh... Lovely day out there. Uh, well, looking forward like today, to getting out there at, at some point. A day like today, it's uh, we all look forward to that little fire you have behind you, Councillor. So uh, good to see everybody on board. We have staff that we chatted earlier. So uh, we move to uh, next item on the agenda, approval of the minutes from the February 3rd, 2022 meeting. So moved. Moved by Councillor Diego Gammon. Second. Second by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We now have official uh, minutes. Now, number three is approval of the order of business, approval of additions and deletions. And uh, Madam Chair, I uh, Madam Clerk, I believe there is one addition, uh, 14 one uh, personnel matter. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, the that matter received consent uh, over email. Uh, so the uh, request now is for the agenda to be approved as amended. Uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, so can we have someone move the uh, order of business? So moved, Mr. Chair. Moved I'll by second Mr. Chair. Chair. Seconded by the uh, by Councillor Austin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We uh, now have an uh, uh, approved agenda. Moving on to number four, business arising out of the minutes. Seeing none, the call for a declaration of conflict of interest. Uh, seeing none, so, uh, none, we have uh, motions of reconsideration, motions of rescission, consideration of deferred business, notice of table matters, that's all none. And then we come to number 10, correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Uh, Madam Clerk, uh, are there any, is there any correspondence? Thank you, Chair. There was one item of correspondence received that was circulated to the committee. Thank you. Uh, what about petitions, colleagues? Any petitions? Uh, seeing none. So now we're coming to presentations. 10.3.1 stormwater and wetlands policy. And we have uh, the folks from uh, Halifax Water, uh, the general manager, Kathy O'Toole. Kathy, are you with us? Uh, I see her coming. I see her. there she is. Kathy, how are you? I understand you have uh, uh, Kendra with you today. Kendra, are you online also? Yes, Kendra McKenzie, our Director of Regulatory Services, is going to make the presentation. Well, fantastic. Kendra, good to see you as always. Uh, uh, your name came up and uh, we, we were talking about you the other day. I will be following up with you. We are reconvening once again to discuss the runoff of uh, uh, onto Lake Charles once again. And you so kindly participated and 
I was chatting with the Minister of Environment the other day, and he's asking you to get together again, so I'll reach out. So always good to see you, Kenda. Thank you. Yeah, you're on mute, uh, uh, Kenda. Sorry, There's... I thought I clicked all my buttons. <laughs> no problem. But good to see you, uh, both you and Kathy. And yes. Kathy tells me uh, you're going to lead on the presentation, so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and so, and thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace, for reaching out and, and offering uh, this opportunity to speak to the committee on Halifax Waters mandates as it ref, uh, refers to uh, wetlands. Uh, next slide, please. So, just to run through some of the key points as it relates to stormwater management. Uh, the province of Nova Scotia is the owner of watercourses, as uh, we all know, and provides the oversight on wetlands uh, when it comes to alterations uh, to a wetland. And that may involve uh, changing the flow to and from a wetland, and that may impact ultimately the size and functionality of the wetland. So that's where the province uh, plays the, the significant role with respect to wetlands and stormwater. Uh, the municipality um, has the oversight on land development, uh, overland flows, and uh, manages uh, some of these aspects through the subdivision and lot grading bylaws. And then Halifax Water plays the role as the owner of the stormwater infrastructure. So predominantly the pipes, the catch basins, the manholes, ditches, swales, and storage facilities. And when a new system is proposed or an extension to an existing system, uh, we will review the design of the new infrastructure to make sure it adheres to our specifications. And one of the uh, key uh, factors there when we establish our specifications is we're looking for consistency in the infrastructure that we own and maintain, uh, making sure that what gets installed is going to be efficient and our operations crews have the materials and the equipment to, to maintain and upgrade uh, that infrastructure accordingly should something uh, need to be replaced or something need to be fixed. So that's why we establish the set specifications for the, the types of infrastructure that go in the ground. With um, our, our mandate uh, that we have to uh, work through with the province, it's focused right now on stormwater quantity and the storage facilities that I mentioned above um, and we'll speak to further are predominantly established to manage and mitigate peak storm flows during events, similar to what we've seen in recent days and weeks. And so ultimately we want to achieve um, the flow that goes to a water course or a wetland. The, the goal is to have basically net zero increase between peak development um, or peak flows during pre-development and post-development situations. As we all know, as uh, areas get developed with hard packed surfaces, the runoff tends to uh, become quicker or, or larger. And so with the storage facilities that get installed, the intention is to try and shave off that peak so that those water courses and wetlands downstream are not overtaxed. The types of stormwater facilities that we currently uh, engage with the development community um, in the installation for their developments can range from oversized pipes underground, uh, tanks that could be underground, and engineered ponds. And the ponds we'll talk about a little bit further, but there are different types of those ponds that uh, are currently have been in place uh, in the past and some of the things that we're looking for uh, installing in the future. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is just a schematic that uh, you may have seen with some of the uh, presentations from HRM staff on the lock grading and such, but it basically gives you uh, a bit of an overview of how stormwater systems are installed and how they will ultimately flow and return water back to uh, a stream or lake, a wetland. And so there could be a series of catch basins and underground piping. Uh, there may be ditches and um, swales culverts that will convey water back to um, a stream or a river. And when those uh, areas, uh, the hard packed areas start to run off to the streets and into the river and the lakes, we want to try and shave off that peak flow so that there isn't um, a significant uh, erosion or overwhelming volumes of water going to those receiving waters. 
Next slide, please. Um, so some of the challenges and that we're currently facing, and there was discussions, I think, at a previous session about uh, impacts to wetlands and whether or not wetlands, uh, natural wetlands, can be used as part of stormwater management. So one of the, the factors that uh, is, is the big one that we have to keep in mind is with a natural wetland, uh, we don't necessarily know the full storage capacity or the impact. So what we're trying to do is manage the volume of water upstream of the watercourses and wetlands. And in designing uh, engineered storage solutions, we have that ability to know what the storage capacity is going to be so that that peak storm event can be managed and that the volume of water going to a watercourse or a wetland downstream is basically replicating what was there prior to the development occurring so that the impact on those receiving waters is, is minimal. And some of the things that uh, when we look at these uh, storage uh, solutions, we need to have ownership or easements over the infrastructure so that we can maintain them, make sure that they're functioning properly, not clogged, that they're cleaned, uh, those types of, of items. Um, and then when it, one of the challenges um, with, when we look at the NSE approvals, we need to make sure that the volume of the flow uh, meets the criteria that, that NSE is looking for from a development um, when they come through. So we wanna make sure that we're on side with their regulations and uh, maintenance and clearing, cleaning may be required uh, as part of the NSE approvals. And so we wanna make sure that we're looking at the, with the engineered solutions that we're not uh, having to deal with um, maintaining or cleaning uh, in and around a wetland because if we were to use wetlands, natural wetlands for storage, uh, our ability to go in and out of there with infrastructure or with gear and equipment uh, may trigger additional approvals from NSC because it may be considered an alteration to a wetland. So that's why uh, when we look at storage solutions, we're looking for um, the utilization of an engineered system. Uh, the other thing, when we look at the impact to downstream receiving waters, uh, be it a water course or wetland, uh, we're also mindful of um, potential contaminants that might enter through the stormwater system. And so having um, a storage solution upstream of a wetland is, is a bit more beneficial where it gives a bit more time to respond should a contaminant get into the system, the storm system, or it may give some time for contaminants to settle out sediment and those types of things so that it would um, have less uh, impact on that wetland or receiving water and uh, be more favorable uh, in the eyes of, of NSE from the impact to that receiving water. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we want to highlight, um, HRM and Halifax Water have committed to completing an integrated stormwater policy. And uh, Regional Council in 2018, I believe, and, and the Halifax Water Board at the same time uh, approved the framework uh, with seven pillars uh, to um, to, to dealing with stormwater as our two entities um, have different um, aspects that we're responsible for and different places where we have to uh, make sure that stormwater is managed properly. One of the aspects or the uh, pillars in the, the integrated stormwater policy is coming up with um, how to manage wetlands and how wetlands can be um, part of the stormwater system, but also uh, be protected uh, from uh, impacts of stormwater, either from uh, significant increases in quantity or quality of the stormwater. And so uh, we're still working towards uh, the completion of this policy. There are aspects of it that have been completed, but we're trying to pull it together into one consolidated document and present it back to, to regional council and our uh, Halifax Water Board. And I suspect both will probably go through our respective environment committees when um, the policy is ready for, for review. 
and so within that policy, we're working through with the Department of Environment on some of the challenges and issues that we collectively see with the use of wetlands as part of the stormwater system or the impact that wetlands may have that exist downstream of stormwater systems. And so these discussions are continuing. Uh, we've had a really productive meeting uh, in the last six months and we'll be following up with uh, staff on both the uh, provincial side and HRM side to continue those discussions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just wanted to highlight some of the, the work that's being done though at looking at um, something different. Now, typically I think you're probably all uh, familiar with the rock lined fenced uh, stormwater ponds that have uh, existed over time. And we're looking at trying to integrate um, more gradual uh, stormwater uh, detention facilities that can be grassed, have a gradual slope. They may be potentially integrated into a green space or a park space uh, with HRM's lands. And they're a bit more aesthetically pleasing uh, within the middle of a development or a developed area. And so there's a pilot project uh, that I think is underway uh, in the Bedford West development, looking at a bioswale. Uh, next slide, please. And there's um, a pitch, the top picture on the, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is more of the rock-lined uh, fenced area that uh, I described that has been historically uh, what's been installed. And as you can see, it's not as aesthetically pleasing. Um, there's a naturalized stormwater pond uh, example on the bottom that was taken in Winnipeg. And so we're slowly um, working towards something that uh, isn't as uh, much of an eyesore, so to speak, but more gradual um, sloped areas to, to maintain those peak flows that we spoke about and uh, fit into the natural environment as best we can. Uh, and I believe that concludes our presentation on how we manage stormwater and how we uh, view natural wetlands but are looking for more natural solutions uh, going forward. So I'll take any questions and I believe some of HRM staff are here as well uh, in case there's any questions that span our uh, responsible areas. And thank you very much for that presentation. Truly appreciate it. We do have some committee members that do have questions, and we'll start off uh, with Councillor Austin. Uh, Councillor Austin, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to Halifax Water for the presentation. Uh, you know, that last slide, uh, more Winnipeg, less pond jails. I mean, Dartmouth Crossing was, uh, it was, they won, rightfully won awards for their approach to managing stormwater. Um, but it, it, it is kind of a product of its, of its time, a step along the evolution, because I mean, that, that's showing what, what's been done there with that Winnipeg example. Uh, beyond just the stormwater service, the ecological benefits are clearly you're getting more habitat uh, space for nature and the natural world in the uh, vegetated option versus your rock wall and chain links um, setup. So uh, more of that, please. And in, in that vein, um, I do have in my district, um, I've got two substantial developments um, coming along um, that do involve uh, uh, issues around water, right? Uh, both Clayton projects, uh, at, uh, one at Penhorn and then the Eisner's uh, Southdale Growth Node, the Eisner's Cove area. And, you know, I, I hear from the developer that they're very interested and Bedford West is their pilot, uh, that they're very interested in trying to do innovative things around stormwater. And I've heard from HRM staff, you know, support for that too on, on this side. And, you know, we have installed that rain garden down at Prince Albert uh, Road and that being a first, it is a bit rock line, but there's nice kind of um, mulchy middle section that will hopefully fill in with plants with time. And uh, so, so my question is, you know, in, in exploring these, I, I, I've gotten the sense that there's still some, you know, issues to be worked out internally of between, you know, 
who is responsible for what, what are the, where, where are these lines like between, well, what is Halifax Waters role? Like in terms of like, well, is it Halifax Waters role when you build the artificial uh, natural area to do the horticultural management, you know, or is it limited to clearing out the drain? Like, you know, trying to define these, it, do we try and stick it if it's a new development permanently with the private developer is their responsibility, right? You know, we've had a long time to sort out well who's responsible for what pipe in the ground but this is new territory and i'm just wondering where we're currently at with those conversations because the sense i had is there is still some that was still a bit of a barrier um to actually getting some of this stuff off the ground and you know out there uh yes uh through you to the through you, the chair, to the councillor, um, you've raised a lot of good points. And the um, what we're going to be probably using is your Prince Albert Road example uh, to use that to kind of manage through the responsibility aspects. Um, Halifax Water uh, Operations staff are geared up and we are equipped to manage the clearing of the pipes and the replacement of the pipes and the grates and those types of aspects. We do not have um, the horticultural uh, arborist type uh, background or, or staffing, and but HRM does. So what we were committing to do, we still have um, uh, regular meetings of what we call our special technical committee where HRM staff and Halifax water staff meet regularly to discuss operational aspects. And um, what we would be looking at is some of those components of that Prince Albert example. And there's a few more that have been coming up to see what makes sense for Halifax water to own and maintain, what makes sense for HRM to own and maintain, or do we enter into some sort of, uh, you know, reciprocating agreement and those types of things. So we are still trying to work through some of those ownership and responsibility uh, aspects uh, with those types of infrastructure uh, solutions. And I see Kathy would like to, to add to um, that response as well. Thanks, Kenda. I just wanted to note that Halifax Water has a stormwater credit program and some of the stormwater best management practices like rain gardens or um, retention ponds that the municipality may be interested in installing within the right of way or within municipally owned properties are eligible to receive stormwater credits. So there may be an incentive for um, that type of, of infrastructure to actually be owned and maintained by the municipality. So there is an eligibility to get the credit. Uh, that's good to know. It's uh, one that, uh, you know, and I don't know what the internal discussions have been between HRM and Halifax Water on this. So at risk of giving away far, the farm and negotiations, I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense for Halifax Water to build up its own horticultural expertise when uh, HRM Parks people, we have excellent, we, we've got that well established um, on our side, it's just a matter of figuring out, well, how, how those responsibilities mesh and how it, how it gets paid for if we end up, if we end up taking on more staff as a result of this and stretching them out into other areas, because I know that's a group that's already kind of pressed to just to do what they already have. Great, Council. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, I give the floor to the Deputy Mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that uh, presentation, Kenda. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we could have this conversation and dig a little bit deeper into wetlands. Uh, it certainly is uh, a complex uh, situation when we consider uh, who owns the actual wetland and therefore who's responsible for it. And I do see there's some parallels here with um, private woodlot owners, you know, in uh, some of the issues that folks have on their own uh, property, on their own private property. So, you know, while we have uh, certainly municipal right away, municipal uh, property, we have provincial property, we have, uh, you know, the 100 series highways that actually have ponds, uh, built to manage the storm water along the highway. And then of course, you've got wetland uh, in uh, on private property where folks are trying to develop it and potentially put uh, housing on it. So, you know, I, I think that this, uh, this 
conversation around quality of stormwater uh, definitely is going to um, continue to become more complex as far as how do we adequately filter some of this uh, stormwater, especially when it's coming off of a, a major corridor, an arterial road, or a 100 series highway to ensure that when it is entering, you know, that uh, vulnerable uh, lake system or, or ponds that we're doing what we can to protect the uh, the habitat and uh, the ecosystem of those uh, of those lakes and ponds. Also, knowing that we don't have any jurisdiction on those lakes, right? Though that's the province. So, you know, I, I do wonder uh, whether or not it's beneficial to uh, strike some kind of a working group, or has there been uh, a working group um, when we consider, uh, you know, the, the municipal, we're, we're not in a bubble, right? HRM is not a bubble. We have uh, municipalities, what is it, five municipalities that border us. So, all of that stormwater that's trying to get to the harbor is coming down from other municipalities, coming in from uh, the 100 series highways. And I commend uh, Halifax Water and the team for the work that you're doing because it's it's a constant catch up um, to be able to, to meet the needs. And so as we think about managing and mitigating this, this peak storm water, because let's face it, that's when the majority of the issues come to play, when we can't manage that peak storm, uh, especially in the wintertime when we've seen the stormwater system just can't manage it. And so it's influ filling on the roads, the storm surge is affecting and destroying the, the road network and all these kinds of things are, are happening. Uh, so I, I'm just wondering whether or not there's an opportunity or has there been discussion with the province and other municipalities to kind of have a, a working group as far as what are we going to do to actually protect the um, vulnerable uh, water system and water courses that we have, uh, especially since I, I don't see us not using salt on the roads anytime soon. And the silt infiltration as well uh, around construction uh, continues uh, to batter the, uh, the vulnerable uh, water systems. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, through the chair to you. Um, there are a few committees that we already have in place. Uh, one big one is uh, the stormwater wastewater uh, committee, the SW3 we refer to it as, with us, HRM and the province. And stemming from discussions on wetlands and trying to develop uh, the appropriate policy components for that integrated stormwater policy that I mentioned, we did strike up a, a subcommittee uh, to talk about uh, stormwater management and, and wetlands and how some of the conservation aspects uh, come into play with respect to that. So we are trying to have the right conversations with the right people in the room on those, those components. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight, and uh, I know Shannon O'Connell's on the call here, she may want to jump in, but with respect to uh, stormwater ponds and management on private uh ICI, industrial commercial institutional properties, there is a requirement uh, for them to manage the peak flow coming from their properties. And that's been in place, I think, since probably 2002 with uh, the Red Book or the Municipal Design Standards that got put in place. And that uh, requirement has stayed in place with the transfer in 2007 to Halifax Water. One of the things that came out of our last rate application on stormwater, uh, there was uh, an agreement between us and HRM to work on a joint design standard. And I believe uh, it was last September, possibly the September before, that HRM took the stormwater bylaw to council. And with the design of some of the um, stormwater retention mechanisms and, and um, uh, tools that de developers use on their property, by default, those are gonna start to um, manage and, and deal with and address some of the quality issues that we see. So just by the nature of what they're required to put on their property, they will meet their requirement to balance the peak flow, but also indirectly manage and address some of the quality aspects. And so there are some things that we, we are kind of working together on and getting in place and knowing that there's, there's probably more to come. And 
right now the big mandate, the big issue with us is that the mandate from our provincial regulator from environment is on the focus of the quantity versus the quality. But we are preparing and, and know that there probably will be a quality aspect of that. And so that's front of mind in, in some of our, our planning documents for the next 30 years and those types of things and the initiatives that we're, we're doing. So, and I see that Shannon has her hand up. She might want to supplement some of the, the components that I spoke about. Thanks, Kendra, mm, thank you. I'm Shannon O'Connell. I'm an engineer with infrastructure planning for HRM. I don't have too much to add. Kenda really nailed all those points and has said that all quite accurately. Um, I just wanted to offer too that uh, myself, uh, we also have Emma Bocking, who is a wetland specialist with the energy and climate change uh, team. She's on the line as well. And we were both part of helping Kenda develop this presentation as well. And I also sit on those committees that Kenda named. So we are very holding hands and trying to do this all together. And we, we have very similar goals. You know, the Health X Water has the mandate that does look specifically more at the quantity, but we have a bit more of an ability in our work to focus on the quality aspect as well. Excellent. Thank you, We've Deputy got a good Mayor. team. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie Mayor. Uh, next, uh, Councillor uh, Kathy Daigle Gammon, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kenda. Um, I always like listening to you. <laughs> I really do. I learn something all the time. Um, when, when you talk about the partnership between Halifax Water, um, you know, the, the province and HRM, my original question actually got answered. So now I'm onto a, a different one just because of the last conversation. And I guess I wonder where, where the environmental advocacy groups come in around, you know, protecting of our environment, all of that kind of stuff. You know, I, I have the privilege of reading all kinds of emails from the Ecology Action Center. And, uh, you know, they've got a really good vested interest as well. So when are they brought into the conversation? I'm just curious about that part. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so, Councillor uh, Deagle Gammon, uh, through you to, from the uh, chair. Uh, we have um, ongoing uh, stakeholder engagement sessions. Um, sometimes kind of there's an ebb and flow in the, in the frequency of them. Uh, currently, uh, we are meeting with um, Swim, Drink, Fish and Sackville Rivers. Uh, on broader uh, initiatives and, and those types of things with respect to um, water quality, CSOs, our, our combined sewer overflows, and those types of things. And when we get into um, uh, specific uh, areas where we're doing capital projects or with our watersheds, we have um, the, the watershed uh, groups within uh, the Lake Major and Pock Walk uh, boundaries. And so there's a lot of the engagement would occur through um, some of those, those avenues and venues. So, but um, we do welcome and, and we're gonna be broadening some of our stakeholder engagement um, uh, protocols and, and processes and programming and be looking at trying to engage more of um, some of the, the non-government uh, operating uh, groups as well. So, so we are having some discussions with some right now and uh, open to open door to, to any discussions from anybody else. Thank you so much, Kenda. Oh, I see uh, Councillor Russell is happy that I asked the question. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor David Gammon. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, go ahead, uh, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kenda, for the presentation. Um, I am interested in uh, kind of a specific question, whether Halifax Water has any recommendations on the size and width of a vegetative buffer around a wetland in terms of maintaining the water quality of the wetland when it's in an area that's being developed. Um, through you, uh, through the chair to you, Councillor Morse, um, we do not have um, specific recommendations uh, in general for wetlands. We do follow um, the provincial legislation on our protected watersheds. So we do have, um, I think, Bennery, Pockwalk, and Lake Major, uh, a required 30 meter buffer 
uh, around those uh, protected watersheds. But when it comes to the specific uh, protection of, of other wetlands that may be within the municipality or other places, uh, we defer to, to um, the province and, and HRM for, for that guidance. And, and we work, do work closely with HRM on their municipal planning strategy updates to ensure that our protected watersheds and the requirements for buffering around those are noted in the regional planning document so that there's uh, full um, transparency for anybody that's developing in those areas that they know that the, the buffer might be 20 meters around any other water course in the municipality, but around those water courses, the buffer is in fact 30. And so that's where our focus is on but uh, we, we defer to the province for any other guidance. Okay, thanks. Could I have a quick follow-up, Mr. Chair? Of course. All right, thank you. So is there anything that Halifax Water is looking to uh, change or um, update in the regional plan uh, that's coming up this winter, the regional plan changes? Uh, we've been given the opportunity to review some of the um, mapping and uh, proposed uh, policy documents. And so uh, we have provided some uh, information to date and we do have probably another uh, just follow up on a couple of uh, more housekeeping items than anything else. Uh, but we are engaged on the, the wetland and or the watershed protection aspects of it. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh... Seeing no others, uh, I have a quick question and uh, maybe I should have had this conversation with the Councillor of the area, uh, Councillor Austin, but Councillor Austin, you alluded to the uh, rain garden that's down on Prince Albert Road. I get inquiries all the time about that. People ask me, what is that? Maybe you need to have a little education, a little signage associated with that uh, to educate people. So I don't know if that's a possibility. Again, I don't want to step on uh, your area, Sam, but uh, I don't know if Halifax Water would be interested to do that or is that something HRM could do just to explain what that is? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair and Councillor, um, we actually do have work going on right now or in the early days of working on a public education program specifically aimed at green infrastructure. And it's going to be twofold. One is to focus on what people can do on their own private property. So if they want to be able to build rain guards or use rain barrels on their own private property. And then the second aspect of it is the public education piece for what they see in the right of way. So exactly what you said, the hopefully having some kind of signage on specifically to Prince Albert Road Rain Garden to be able to say, this is what it is, this is why it looks like this and what it does. And <laughs> please don't ask us to mow it, is the hope. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic there, uh, Shannon, thanks so much. Well, thank you, Halifax Water, uh, Kathy and Kenda. Thank you both, uh, as always, really appreciate your time today. Mr. Chair, if I could just yep. chime in quickly. Uh, yep. Plus one to the idea of uh, some interpretive signage at that location. Uh, that is a really, really good idea. And so, um, Shannon, we can talk more about that. Great. Thank you both. Thank All the you. Best. Thank All you. right, folks. Uh, let's see, where are we now? Uh, that was the only presentation for today. So item number 11, information items, there were none. There's no reports. Uh, to be discussed and we have one uh, motion uh, with 13.1 forwarding the wildlife corridor landscape design uh, report. Uh, I believe that's uh, uh, Councillor Morris, is that yours? Uh, nope, that's oh, mine. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, no worries. Mayor, it's yours. We'll put the motion on the floor, please. Yeah, I'll uh, throw it on the floor. Uh, I move that uh, the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee for the Wildlife Corridor Landscape Science Charette Report to Regional Council for consideration and inclusion with the Green Network Plan. Second. I will second that. Uh, I believe I heard uh, Kathy uh, Daigle Gammon seconding that. Councillor, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so this uh, this motion came out of uh, last month's uh, Environment S Sustainability Standing Committee meeting on uh, February 3rd, uh, where we had a presentation on this charrette report, um, which took place uh, back in March 2021 when it was compiled by uh, numerous individuals, uh, wildlife biologists, academics, conservation planners, urban planners, and community leaders. Now, primarily, um, the uh, presentation that we received uh, last month was in regards to Action 32. 
and looking at uh, the Action 32 of the Green Network Plan, which states to amend the regional plan and municipal planning strategies to prioritize the preservation and creation of natural connections to the Shibukto Peninsula uh, from the mainland um, when reviewing development proposals and updating planning policies and zoning in the area. Now, what's great about the ne uh, Green Network Plan is it does zone in uh, using Map 9 uh, in the Green Network Plan. It zones in to look at uh, the corridors, the wildlife corridors corridors. But this uh, amendment of the charrette would provide far more insight in looking uh, at regional plan review updates, looking at ways that we could amend potential zoning, looking at how specifically we can advance conservation and also those connections, those natural connections for wildlife. Um, now, we do know that there has been uh, presence uh, of mainland moose uh, on the Shibukto Peninsula. And uh, we know that it's difficult for them to get across and to continue to move uh, upwards uh, into the Ingram uh, wilderness area, uh, into uh, various other parts of the province, and especially moving down south into the South Shore. So the hope here, uh, my hope with this motion is that we actually could take uh, this information that we have, which is very detailed uh, data sets and, and maps uh, and the work that was done uh, last year and amend it uh, so that um, staff have that in regards to looking at the regional plan review and all of the various different land use bylaws, as well as um, thinking about, you know, that that huge project uh, that planning and development is doing in um, in uh, revising all of those uh, land use bylaws, which some of them date back to the 1980s. So as we update those, I think having this key information about wildlife corridors is essential. Uh, and I'd love to see it uh, as an additional uh, resource for the Green Network Plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, any questions on that, uh, committee members? Just a, comment, so, just a ahead. comment, if I could. Yep. Yeah, Council. Councillor Morris, um, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor, for bringing this forward. I think it's um, an, an incredibly valuable resource and so many um, experts uh, have volunteered their time to contribute to this. Um, and it, uh, I think is an important asset for our planning team. Um, one of the um, things that struck me about it was the um, importance of uh, wildlife connectivity around the Hammonds Plains Road near Kearney Lake. Um, and if we are, you know, we're going to be developing in that area, if we can maintain some degree of forest cover there, it'd make a huge difference for wildlife, um, moose perhaps, but there are bobcat in the area we know, um, and, and many other species. And, and uh, if we can also come up with guidelines using this um, material, it could perhaps um, guide private development um, and as well as public development. So I think it's a very valuable resource. I look forward to the picture of the moose and the bobcat crossing together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, seeing no other uh, questions or comments, uh, we uh, call for the question. Question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And that's been carried. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, appreciate it. Uh, tough crowd <laughs> we do have uh let's see here um an in-camera item is there any appetite to deal with this in-camera item without having to go in camera i'm happy to put the motion on the floor if the uh is agreement okay so it looks like it so if you wouldn't mind uh, council that'd be great uh, you you see it in the agenda yes um, I move that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee 1 adopt the recommendation as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated February 28, 2022, and 2 direct that the private and confidential staff report dated February 28, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Member Seconder. Second. Second by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's been uh, passed. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor, for doing that. Number 15 is added items. Seeing none, notice of motions. Seeing none. Uh, there, this is usually the time for public participation. The Madam Clerk, we do, don't have anybody signed up. Is that correct? Thank you, Chair. Yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. So there's no public participation today. So the, the, the date of the next meeting is April the 7th. 
2022, uh, I've been told there will be no snow on that day. So we're <laughs> calling this meeting uh, for calls for adjournment. I move uh, to adjourn. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, everybody. If you are traveling, uh, you're travel carefully. <laughs>